Being original, I think, is verging on the impossible nowadays because everyone is expressing themselves and there are so many influences that it's almost impossible to make things because you can't live in a void and make, like, develop your own. But I think it's really possible to develop your own identity and your own sound. And this comes with practice and defining limits in which you are going to work and then developing those tools and uh, your skills like as much as you can. I don't really come from a musically inclined family, but there was always some kind of music, sometimes cheesy, bad pop music being played, but that got me attached to it. And um, from there, basically, it evolved and I got, I got involved in the scene. I discovered a lot of music thanks to the squats that were around the area at the time. And that really blew my mind. And the more I went to the parties, the more I got like, involved in collecting music in finding out about music in visiting also record stores. And then from there, yeah, I got really curious about how to make it. And then it became an obsession. And then I, yeah, I just couldn't avoid making it. We're here in my studio in uh, Schönbuch and I'm gonna show you around like all the bits of kits that I've amassed over the years. My most precious device is the sequencer, the Circlon, because this one was one that I was really curious about. Had to wait pretty long to actually get one. And once I finally did, then, then I understood how good it actually was to have a sequencer that you can really play, which is very different than having, for example, a door where you click and uh, you have a different kind of interface. This one is really, it's really fun. And the manual looks like a NASA manual, which is fantastic. And it looks like a spaceship kind of thing. So when you're using it, you feel like you're at the commands of, yeah, a Sputnik or something like that. It would, I wouldn't say it made the tracks, but it's, allowed me to get out of sequencing things on the computer and thinking in a very different way. It's not about aligning blocks in the piano roll anymore. It's about, to some extent, it's also about like having this visual return, but then you have only this green light that tell you if a note was on or off, and then you can just arrange them and see how it goes. And you can also really play the melodies with some functions. Yeah, you can use this. They have this thing called the sculpt mode, where once you have a, a sequence, you can start, for example, with a, a rhythmic bass, where all the notes are the same. And then by using the sculpt, you can move the notes around while ke keeping the same rhythm. So basically you can, if you have a melody in your head, but you suck at writing melodies because you don't have the proper uh, uh, knowledge, then you can really just go around and sculpt it and say, I want it to go low and I want it to go high and I want it to go even higher. And that's really fun to do, like perfect for acid lines. So the mixer is as a part that is as important as the rest. What, what is fantastic about it is that, first of all, it sounds fantastic. The, um, the EQs, the preamps, the summing is amazing. 
and because I come from dub, basically, I always had this fantasy of having a big mixer and many sends and sending stuff in and out and playing with effects. Uh, I still like educate myself in this respect, but it allows me to to record, well, to actually channel all the synths, first of all, so everything is plugged and everything is playable at any given time. So this is really, really nice. I never have to think about plugging or unplugging some piece of gear. And I think this is very important when you are in the creative process because then it allows you to have ideas flowing. And also it allows you to have happy accidents, which I find happen less when you work in the box. And yeah, it's the first thing that I ever bought that came in a truck and that was unloaded with a, uh, on a pallet. And now that it's here, I will need to call a couple of friends to move it out one day. So the last piece of kit I got was Roland Coroseco RE501, which is legendary. So for people who don't know what it is, uh, the Chorus Echo is the studio big brother of the RE201, which is a delay, like it's a tape delay. And it's it has a legendary status because it was, was used basically on many, many dub production, many, many rock production, and basically I think everything that had an echo at some point um, in the 60s and 70s must have come from this. It has a fantastic spring reverb inside, it has a chorus that sounds nice and dirty, and, and it's one of those things, it's a delay that you can also really play with because you can control the speed of the of the tape so that will give you a different tone because you can slow it down make it faster you can control how loud the tape gets rewritten and how much feedback it has and if you open it up you can basically also play around with the tape and go really really experimental with it so i'm using this door um, that is called bitwig studio it's for me, it's a fantastic bit of kit in the sense that it allowed me to start really thinking not in terms of tracks, but how everything can interact with it, uh, everything else. The, um, the elements that are given with the, with the door are very, very simple. Everything is extremely simple, but they integrated the option to be able to modulate everything with everything. So you can use uh, um, audio to modulate a, a parameter, any parameter. You can use uh, LFOs to modulate any parameters. You can use step sequencer. You can use whatever you want. You can use audio in to modulate, or audio from your external gear to modulate stuff in there. And, and it has some very nice and practical things about it as well, which I really like. So when I was a kid, I used to live really close to the CERN, where the internet was born. And I remember having this neighbor who actually got access to the internet and having this very long ethernet cable coming from his balcony to our balcony 
and connecting to the very, very first web pages. You needed time to load the page, you needed to take the time to read the pages. And that pace, I think, was very important because it forced you to process the information. And for that, the internet was something very powerful. And the first social medias that I've discovered on the internet were the forums. And that was fantastic for me because that was a way of connecting to people that you, you had no idea existed. Sometimes people on your own city, sometimes people from far away. But again, it was this slow pace of posting something, dreaming of getting a notification of a reply to your post or your question, and then like starting a discussion. That was really good. And the pace was also good because it forced you to think about it. The evolution of it has become platforms that are generalist, like the forums, they were all very specialized. And now we all use either Facebook or Instagram. And as much as we try to control whatever we see in our feeds by subscribing or not to people, we end up still being very dependent of what the algorithms believe, they, believe that we want, or maybe they know that we want. I don't know what the correct answer is. But it also took out the value of all this information and of all this sharing of data. Because I find it exciting to see an artist, what an artist is doing in his studio or what technique he might be using or something like that through his Instagram stories or his posts or to see that they played somewhere. But it's become so short and so instant and also so lost in this sea of information that it has, it has lost its value and it has made me disconnect from it as well because it's become too much to some point. So this synth is another one of those things that I had to wait a very long time to get my hands on. It's the Swedishman S1MK2. And like people in the know and people in the Eurorack world, they know that Swedishman makes those extremely well-tuned and calibrated uh, modules. And this one is basically one full synth voice. And it's a full synthesizer, which is pre-patched in the back, but then you can also use it like a modular synthesizer and modulate, use either inputs or outputs to modulate different inner elements. And it's really nice because it's, I think it's one of the only bits of kits that if I turn the studio off and I turn it back on, everything is still sounding exactly the same, which really surprised me. And also what's really nice about it is that it can do so many things at once that is at the beginning i found it a bit overwhelming and now i'm getting more into using it for what i know i want to get out of it but i also try to spend time just experimenting with it to see where it can go because it can do very interesting things the thing below um the thing below has a nice story uh, it comes from uh, new york actually and the th so the thing below is a Waldorf XT a microwave and it doesn't microwave but uh, it actually sounds pretty hot and the guy who sold it to me told me there was a bomb sticker on it because I would make bomb tracks with it and I so I kept it because I found the story fantastic um, and it's a really interesting synth it does wavetable synthesis with uh, digital fil that there's a digital filter and then at the end of the circuit there's an analog filter which is a six pole db i think or a four pole db and what's really fantastic about it is that it can sound very otherworldly and this one is actually responsible for a lot of the his 1292 tracks because we used it a lot with uh, francois x and it can sound it can make really 
dreamy pads and it can sound very aggressive. Yeah, it, it's also a thing that you can really explore sounds with and see where it leads you. And it has full MIDI CC, which makes it a dream to work with on the, on the Cyclone because I can also control for every note any of the parameters of the, of the synth. So below I have my oldest bits of kits, actually. So the, my Sheen drum, which is the one thing I bought very early on um, because of a guy called Vizen, who was doing those fantastic uh, video tutorials on YouTube and showing how interesting a machine it can be. It's a machine that I had a really long love and hate relationship. There were many times I wanted to throw it out the window. Many times I wanted to sell it and thinking it wasn't even worth selling because it was so shit. And also many times when it actually was the best thing that I ever owned in my life. So, so it's really transformed into, into this kind of thing that you, you know you love, you know you hate. Sometimes it gives you back something that you really like, sometimes it doesn't and you learn to work with it but it's a fan yeah now they've gotten really cheap and it's a really fantastic bit of kit you're looking for a 12-bit sampling this is what you need in order to believe that the sound originates outside mind we must whether we realize it or not, believe that mind exists inside the body. Yeah, Geneva is the city you try to escape, but you always come back to. Yeah, the city and the neighborhood really like does influence the music in the sense that it's really calm, so you don't have that many distractions and you can really focus on what you want to do. And at the same time, it still has enough input that it gets you inspired to do stuff. You can still discover stuff. Yeah, Geneva is actually a place where the electronic music scene is somehow booming. It used to be a platform for many people. Derek May used to live here for five years. Um, Cassie lived here for a long while. Luciano and Quenum founded Cadenza here. So it's been a platform for many electronic music artists and it slowed down for a couple of years, but now it's really picking up again with independent labels, artists also doing stuff that are super local. So now it's actually a really good time. Actually, compared to 10 years ago, it's really good. There's stuff happening three nights a week, every week, basically. We have really big lineups, like just this week, we have Jeff Mills and Tony Allen, Gerard Johnson, Sven Witt. A DJ for me is someone who wants to really share the music that they really love and to like allow people to experience that music. So it comes first from a love of music, a love of finding music and of sharing it. And then from there it builds to becoming an art form where the way you present stuff and the way you contextualize every track and every piece of music during the night and in every different setting can totally change the perception of that piece of music. So DJing is about sharing the music and then learning how you can present that music in the best way and presented in a way that becomes your own in the end.
so that's my that's my record on uh, on the new demented uh, platform that Francois X is doing demented XXX and I was actually really happy to have it out because it had been many years that I had released stuff on uh, on Demented with Francois X as his 1292 and we were always talking about it and yeah he really pushed me to make to make this record into what it is today and interestingly he was also the one who really made me realize that I had reached another point in my music making whereas before it really felt that I was like teaching myself about a lot of music, about techno, about experimental music, about dance music as well. And yeah, doing this record, like I really felt that I had reached another point and that made me want to drop the use of the pseudonym and to start to present myself under my own name. So this is the first record as Hendrik van Boetselaar, which I'm really, yeah, I'm really proud of it. No, but I bought this, be I bought this because Peter van Hosen has one <laughs> in his studio, you know, like that's, that's very easy. Like I saw that in his studio, I was like, fuck, this is so nice. So Peter has one, Steffi has one, Marcel Fengler has one, and Matthew Johnson has one. But they have the lower model, this is the higher model. But it's the very last one ever made. So I got it very cheap. Can you try? Yeah, okay, <laughs> oh no fuck! <laughs> My smile must be too big now, <laughs> you know, like, yes, that's mine! That, was that arrogant? No! <laughs> no. <laughs>